Hi, and welcome to the uh, May 25th webinar. This is the final webinar in May is Midi Month 2019. My name is Adam Billius. Uh, I work for Yamaha. I'm on the executive board of the Midi Manufacturers Association. And today we're going to be talking about MIDI 2.0. Um, want to welcome all of our listeners. Thanks for joining us. We have a great panel today. Uh, and so what I'd like to do is I'd like to invite each of our each of our guests to introduce themselves, and they can tell you who they work for and what their relationship with MIDI is. Um, unfortunately, our first panelist, Amos Gaines, has not joined us yet, uh, but Amos works for Moog Music. He is the chairman of the Technical Standards Board of the MIDI Manufacturers Association. Uh, the next person on our list is Andrew Mee. Andrew, uh, can you introduce yourself and tell us what you do? Hi, my name is Andrew Mee. I am a consultant for Yamaha. I have been mainly focused on property exchange and uh yeah it's, it's quite exciting so there you go great thanks andrew uh our next panelist is dave starkey dave has been uh, a member of the midi manufacturers association for many many years and his company actually has midi in the name of it dave introduce yourself please Maybe now. Okay, hi, my name is Dave Starkey and I work for, uh, I have a company named MIDI9, which has been around, uh, we've been around for quite a while, designing MIDI controllers for pianos. I also uh, work for the Piano Arc company. We make a circular piano with 288 keys. And I've been involved in the protocol uh, of the MIDI 2.0 for uh, well over 10 years. Thanks, Dave. Uh, next up, it's joining us our first guest uh, from Europe. Andrew Mee is actually in Australia. Uh, Dave is here in Southern California. Joining us from uh, somewhere in Europe is Florian. Florian, say hello. Hi, uh, I'm Florian Baumers of Baum Software. Um, I'm creating MIDI translation software and hardware uh, for quite a while. And uh, I am from Munich, Germany. Great, thank you. Our next guest is also from uh, in Europe. Um, he is Franz Dietro. He works for Native Instruments. Franz, say hi to our panel. Yeah, hello. Uh, as already said, I'm uh, Franz Dietro. I'm an engineer at Native Instruments and working there as a tech lead for protocols and system architecture. And uh, this job, and privately, I have quite some experience in MIDI, and I'm really excited to be here in this uh, panel today. Thanks, Franz. Um, our uh, next panelist is Mike Kent. Um, Mike is on the Technical Standards Board uh, of the MMA. Mike, say hi. Hello, everybody. Um, uh, I run my own consulting company called MK2 Image Limited. I'm a consultant to uh, mostly media and audio industry, including uh, uh, most recently Yamaha, Apple, and Roland. Prior to being a consultant, I worked for Roland for many, many years in research and development. And I've been a member of the MIDI Manufacturers Association since 1994. Great. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Phil Burke works for Google. We're very happy to have Google. Uh, the MIDI Manufacturers Association is is one of the few places uh, where Apple, Google, and Microsoft get together and agree on anything. Uh, so, Phil, can uh, you say hello? Uh, hello. Uh, yeah, um, I've been uh, working with MIDI quite a long time. Uh, actually, I was doing experimental computer music stuff just before MIDI came out, and MIDI made things much easier. Uh, then worked a bit in the game industry and. Uh, and also uh, developing uh, MIDI ringtone synthesizers and uh, synthesis software. Uh, then lately been working at uh, Google on the Android, adding uh, MIDI APIs and uh, interactive audio APIs to, to support real time in, in MIDI. And then uh, for the past 10 or years or longer, I've uh, been uh, uh, working with the MMA on the 
uh, MIDI 2.0 protocols, mostly focusing on the protocol area and trying to converge various designs and um, enjoying that very much. Thanks, Phil. Uh, the The next person on our panel, I, I believe, is the longest standing current um, technical standards board member. Uh, he was a former chairman of the TSB. And Rick Cohen, how, how long have you actually been associated with the uh, MMA? I think it was either uh, 89 or 90. So um, pretty long time now. Probably almost as long as you, Adam. Uh, yeah, I, I have worked for Kurzweil Music Systems and also for various other software companies and game companies. Um, I'm also one of the founders of Cubic Audio and Together Audio, which do um, plug-in synth engines and also some standalone plugins. And uh, as Adam said, I've been working on this protocol working group for a very, very long time. And we're really excited to be able to tell you some information about MIDI 2 today. Great, thanks, Rick. Um, so we are gonna jump into it now. Um, if uh, the people on the, uh, on the, in the audience would like to go to um, the article that is on MIDI.org, you can just go to MIDI.org uh, click on the articles page and you will you will see this article that we put up this week details about MIDI 2.0 MIDI CI profiles and property exchange it's been updated there's a, a good deal of new information about MIDI 2.0 so we're, we're going to jump right in um, we believe that MIDI 2.0 is the largest set of additions to MIDI since the very first MIDI connection back in 1983 and what's interesting is we had a history of MIDI panel last week with Dave Smith, uh, Jeff Rona, the first president of the MMA. The discussions of um, extensions to MIDI started in 1983. Um, so, you know, immediately after um, the um, initial MIDI spec specification was put together, people started to think about what needed to be added. And, and of course, in the, in the first 10 to 15 years of, of of MIDI, there were lots of additions. There was the addition of uh, MIDI show control. There was the addition of MIDI time code. Uh, there was general MIDI. It has taken a little bit, little bit of a while uh, to get to the point where we could actually get to get to MIDI 2.0. And I'd like to turn it over at this point to Mike Kent. Um, he was one of the people who came up with the initial idea for MIDI capabilities inquiry and brought it both to uh, AME, which is the Japanese MIDI organization, and to the MMA. So Mike, could you talk a little bit about the infrastructure and how we were able to solve this very fundamental problem, which was there are literally billions of MIDI devices on the planet. They all use MIDI 1.0, and how can you do something new and still keep backwards compatibility with current devices. Mike? Sure, uh, thanks. The, uh, in the article, you'll see the first uh, diagram that comes up is kind of this map of MIDI CI and what it does. And we had several goals in, in MIDI CI. Uh, first of all, one of the ideas was that if you want to do more things than what MIDI 1.0 can do, how can you do that and still protect backwards compatibility? And that was the fundamental idea of MIDI CI was it should be bi-directional uh, so that one device talks to another and says, hey, can you do the new things? And if the other device doesn't answer, you just continue to use MIDI 1.0 as always. But if it does answer, you can ask it what kinds of new things it can do. Um, and so it protects backwards compatibility in that way, um, in that you only only use extended features when the other device answers and says yes, I can I can use those extension uh, extended features. And uh, MIDI CI um, adds fee uh, or allows us to add features to MIDI 1.0 as well as uh, creating uh, a path to MIDI 2.0. So in that uh, in that diagram. You'll see in the very center is MIDI CI, which is um, connecting two devices to each other. 
Uh, this is just standard MIDI connections and is using system exclusive messages. And MIDI CI uh, allows one device to ask the other, uh, do you do any of these things? And there are three P's, as we call them, that um, the other device can reply. It says, yes, I can do these things. So there's profile configuration, property exchange, and protocol negotiation. And we'll discuss a little bit about each of those uh, as we go on today. Um, and in this diagram, you'll see that um, if, if a device says the profiles are not supported, you just continue to use MIDI 1.0 as, as you always did. Um, if property exchange is not supported, just use MIDI 1.0. And same thing with the, the MIDI 2.0 protocol, which is where we get all the new messages. Um, if, if the other device doesn't support it, um, then MIDI 1.0 just continues to work. And so MIDI CI is this protection of backwards compatibility while expanding into these new areas and possibly new areas that we haven't defined in the future. MIDI CI could allow us to add further categories of, of new capabilities beyond these three Ps. Um, so let's start talking with about profile configuration a little bit. Um, and uh, if you scroll through the article, you'll come to um, a diagram uh, labeled profile configuration demo. And there's a video just below that done by Adam Billius, the host of our, of our uh, presentation here this morning, um, showing the idea of profiles. And profiles basically says, let's all do the same things in a similar manner. Or if we're going to do the same things, let's use the same MIDI messages to do those. So as an example, I, I happen to play quite a bit of organ. I've got several different uh, drawbar organs. Uh, that are, that you know all emulate a B3, and there's a pretty well-known model of of what a B3 does. And there's draw bars, and there's a Leslie, and uh, there's percussion on and off, and there's there's certain tremolos and chorus. And I have personally, I have two different Roland organs that are you know because I worked for Roland for many many years. I got two Roland organs with draw bars on them. I have uh, a plug-in that I use in Logic quite a bit. And I have a, a B3 on my iPad that I like quite a bit as well. And none of these talk to each other. That is, you know, if I move the eight foot draw bar on any one of these four that I own, it doesn't control the other, other three that I own because they all use different messages for that draw bar. So the idea is a prof of a profile is that we would write a specification that says, this is the way a draw bar organ works, or this is the way a piano works or electric piano or this is how orchestral string articulation is done. And if devices through MIDI CI report that they support that profile, then auto configuration can happen. So for example, a DAW could ask a plugin, um, what profiles do you support? And, the pro and if the plugin says, I'm a, I conform to the, to the drawbar organ profile, then the DAW could automatically just create a, a, um, an interface to that and know which controllers are being used to control uh, that, uh, that plugin. Same with the controller keyboard that's connected to the DAW. It could map automatically all of its sliders and, and knobs and switches to control the functions of a drawbar organ. And then when you switch to an electric piano plugin, instead of drawbars, you'll have you know, control over volume and tone and um, uh, tremolo amount and speed and maybe phaser amount and phaser speed and so on, things that relate and are very commonly found on electric piano plugins. So this is the idea of profiles, is, is just defining very common, uh, common sets of controls for the basic things that do, that, that are done on these very common kind of instruments. Um, so that's profile configuration. Uh, anybody on the panel have a, anything further to add about that? No. Okay. Leave it. Leave all the work to me. It's okay. <laughs> all right. Yeah, no. Well, at, at, so, sorry, oh, Mike. Yeah. I just yeah. yeah. I just wanted to point out that actually, uh, profile configuration um, was adopted by the MMA. Uh, so if you if you go if you look at the article, MIDI CI specification is available for download uh, at MIDI.org for members of the MIDI Association. The MIDI Association is, is free to join. It is the community of people who work, play, and create um, with MIDI. 
Um, so it is free to in, for individuals to join. MIDI CI is downloadable, downloadable because it has been approved. Profile, um, the general rules of, uh, sorry, common rules for profiles uh, was adopted at the Winter NAM show and should be available sometime in the near future. Um, I think what I'd like to do is I'd like to ask Andrew to jump in and talk a little bit about property exchange because he actually has been doing a lot of the work and has developed a workbench and there's a, a video that you can watch later on uh, showing exactly how how property exchange uh, will work in the future. And I, I do want to mention this. P property exchange is still under development. So we cannot actually discuss uh, specifics of it. And the reason for that is property exchange will probably change the way it works in the next uh, you know, few weeks, maybe a couple months. And we don't want anyone to start developing and building something based on early specifications because that will, will cause interoperability problems. That's one of the things that is very important to the MIDI Manufacturers Association and to AME, which is the Japanese uh, organization which controls MIDI, is we need to make sure that MIDI devices are interoperable because that is the most important thing about MIDI. So having said that, Andrew's going to jump in and he's going to tell you a little bit about what property exchange uh, can do and some thoughts that we have for developing some new capabilities in property exchange in the future. Andrew? Thanks, Nathan. Um, so obviously I'm doing uh, some of the work on property exchange with some other great people as part of the working group. Uh, property exchange is uh, a little bit different than profiles in the sense that its aim is to try and understand uh, what the device or soft synth or whatever it is, or control a keyboard and what it is on the other end. And this is, this is really born out of uh, when I go and connect a device to, you know, any piece of equipment, my biggest problem is that, you know, there might be a set of controller messages or there's a list of programs or uh, there's a, some kind of extra control that makes it very difficult to kind of set that up using normal MIDI. You've got to do a lot of it manually or you've got to have special applications to manage that. So property exchange is a way of providing all of that information uh, between the devices and giving those devices a lot more control. Um, one of the things that we've, we've, we've been doing a fair bit of experimenting uh, and as Athens said, it's still in fairly heavy development, uh, but there's some really great possibilities. And the video kind of goes through some of that thing. And we've been experimenting with things like uh, auto-generated uh, editors for uh, devices, but also, you know, being able to get their program lists, uh, being able to sit, look at the controls. So the idea is that when you connect your device, it auto-configures and hopefully you'll know everything about that device without actually having to uh, touch you touch any kind of manual setup. So that's, that's the stuff that really kind of excites me. Um, and the idea about this is that it can also grow with demand as well. So we've tried to make it as flexible, but without making it too flexible um, to make it out of control. But it sort of can grow with whatever the future holds and doesn't actually have to just be sound equipment. It could be any kind of device that talks over MIDI. Um, and so it's sort of this common set of communication. Yeah, Andrew, I think that's a really important point. Uh, I think um, it's important to note that with both profiles, property exchange, and actually even with protocol, we are this is really we're at the very beginning of what could be a, a, a renaissance of MIDI and new MIDI specifications that probably will continue for the next five to ten years. In it, When MIDI 1.0 was done in 1983, it was a seven-page document. By 1996, uh, it was it was multiple pages with multiple tables. It had show control in it. All of these things were added. And what actually happened, and this is a good transition to protocol negotiation, 
you know, by 2005 or six, we had basically filled up all of the space. There were no opcodes left to do anything in MIDI 1.0. And so we really had to figure out what was the way that we could c come up with a methodology to be able to break through and have the ability to add future messages. Um, you know, the MIDI 2.0 specification adds a lot of great things, but one of the greatest things that it adds is a huge amount of space for future expansion for the next 30 years of MIDI. Um, property exchange is also very much like that in that property exchange work will continue over the next few months and, and, and probably be adopted, uh, you know, in, in, uh, in, in the, by 2020. Um, but it will also open up for the future expansion of continuing to add property exchange message, continuing to add new profiles. So we encourage everybody uh, to join the MMA and, and really join in this new renaissance of MIDI. Uh, with that, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Rick Cohen. Rick is the chairman of the protocol uh, working group inside of the MMA, and he can talk a little bit about protocol negotiation and MIDI 2.0. Rick? Hi. Yeah, I'm back. I hope you can all hear me. I had an audio muting issue. Um, I also want to welcome Amos Gaines. I believe he's joined the conference now. He's the Hello, chair yes. of the TSB. So he's Thank on you, the and we can hear well. you just fine, Rick. Great. Um, so when you think about MIDI 2.0, you might be thinking primarily about the MIDI messages that would be changed for a new version. And we call that the MIDI 2.0 protocol. All these other pieces that we've been describing up till now are also part of, part of a bigger MIDI 2.0 environment. So um, there's a blue box in the, in the article that Avin is scrolling through right now. Um, which describes a little bit about the difference there. The, the initial MIDI 1.0 was sort of limited um, in how complex it could become because of the interface that was being used at the time. Um, it was inexpensive enough to become ubiquitous, which is great. Since then, we've had 35 years and we've put MIDI on lots of other transports, we call them, such as USB or even inside the DAW, those things can run a lot faster and at higher resolutions. So now we've designed the MIDI 2 protocol to take advantage of some of those things. In order to make MIDI 1 and MIDI 2 um, able to be transmitted on the same cable, we've done a little bit of plumbing underneath called the universal MIDI packet. Um, which is in section 1.5 of the doc, the article that you can find on MIDI.org. And it just shows that we have a new packet which can take different lengths of messages and can encapsulate the, the MIDI 1 messages or the MIDI 2 messages. Uh, you can read more about that later but or ask me a question when we get to the question section. Uh, if we go on to section 151, you'll see that there are, there's a table of message types. Some of those are the MIDI 1 messages that you know and love. And then there are some that are MIDI 2 messages. Each one has a different message type. So they could possibly um, be used in a simultaneous fashion on the new universal MIDI packets. So the, the interesting one probably for a lot of you will be um, message type four, which is listed here as the MIDI 2 channel voice messages. But we've also expanded some of the other kinds of messages that are commonly used in MIDI, like um, the SysX, which gives a very open-ended way for devices to send any sort of data. We've expanded that in MIDI 2 as well. And we'll be talking about that a little bit later. Let's see if we scroll on here. Um, I'm going to 152. Um, one of the, the things that is expanded in MIDI 2 is the idea of having more channels. 
the existing MIDI spec has 16 MIDI channels on any cable. And if you want to have more than 16 MIDI channels, you use multiple cables, even if they're virtual cables inside your DAW. Uh, we've added the concept of groups of channels here. So each of the 16 groups can have 16 channels. And that way you're expanding your capability up to 256. Um, I'm trying to go a little fast so that we can get to the question sooner. Um, 153, this is a very important area, something that we didn't really have the capability of in MIDI 1 was timestamps which would allow you to send a lot of messages right after each other and have them all uh, sound at the same time. So a large group of notes would all be set with the same timestamp and now you can play them all simultaneously. And that reduces uh, an effect that we call jitter. Um, moving along here in 154, we're showing here in this picture how the old um, current MIDI 1.0 messages can be transported in the new format, the new transport format, which is called the universal MIDI packet. And uh, moving down finally to 155, we're finally going to get to talk about some of the new messages. We've picked one as an example, uh, of course, there are many, many messages. The first one we figured we'd talk about that most people would use would be the note on message. So if you look at the picture of the note on message, this shows all the fields that would be transmitted in a MIDI 2.0 message. In a MIDI 1 message, you would have the status, you would have the channel, you'd have the note number, and you'd have the velocity. So we've got a few new ones here. We've got the channel group, which is the second field. We've also got an expanded velocity field. Uh, in MIDI 1, it's 7 bits, and here we have 16. And we have a new field called the attribute. And the attribute is another um, field that can be set at note on time. And depending on what kind of note you're triggering, it might have different applications. Like one good example might be the stick position on the head of your drum. And so you can, you could have an attribute type defined, which would be the stick position and the attribute would be, the value would be shown uh, next to the velocity. So that's the MIDI note on message for MIDI 2. Uh, I'm going to move on now to the next section. Some of you are familiar with sort of the extended controls that are available in MIDI 1. In addition to the normal MIDI controllers, we have registered parameter numbers and non-registered parameter numbers, which gives you a much broader um, range of numbers that you can use to, to send these. But they're hard to use because you have to send multiple messages in a, in a row in order to select which registered parameter you're going to use and then set the value. So now that we have messages that are larger and that can contain more bytes, we can consolidate those and make it really easy. We've also renamed non-registered parameters to assignable controllers. So we've got registered controllers and assignable controllers. The registered ones are all going to be uh, specified by MMA and AME. The assignable ones can be used by different manufacturers in different ways. And there's a very wide data field, 32 bits. So there's plenty of room for high res custom messages for different applications. Is thing, these uh, the new messages are actually smaller than using the uh, the old style RPN and RPN multi message uh, messages. Uh, excellent point, Phil. Yes, it, because they're atomic, even though they are conveying more information and easier, they're actually using fewer bytes to send down the cable. Moving along and to wait, the oh, sorry, go on, Nathan. Sorry. Yeah, it's way easier to track in the DAW. That that's always a problem with multiple messages getting, you know, following them 
and editing them in the DAW. Yes, excellent point. This will make their uh, application is going to be much uh, broader because they're going to be so much easier to use and the editors will probably support them in a much better way as well. Um, speaking of grouping messages, the next one is the program change message. One of the additions we made to MIDI 1.0 after a certain amount of time, we realized that uh, 128 program numbers per MIDI channel was just not going to cut it. So we added uh, the bank select message by stealing uh, two of the MIDI controllers from the available list. Now what we've done in the MIDI 2.0 program changes, move the bank select fields right into the program change message. So again, a DAW won't have to write special code to group together your controller 0 and 32 and your program change into a single unit because it is a single unit already. Um, there's a very short uh, paragraph here in 1.57 about new messages. And uh, what that says here is um, that we, in addition to the existing SysX, we've got some new data types, data, data messages, sorry, um, the mixed data and the SysX8. And both of those can be used to send large batches of data without having to encode them and decode them with a special codec to make them fit into MIDI 1.0 transport limitations. So it will be much easier to send this manufacturer specific data or um, large media files over MIDI 2 protocol without uh, needing to encode them and decode them in the same way. That's the seven bit stuff. You can avoid the seven bit stuff that's involved with doing SysX today. Right, Dave. Thank you. Um, th that's exactly the purpose of that. So the last three sections here are all about what's coming. Uh, you've been waiting over 35 years now for what's coming. And I think we've given you a good taste of it right now. Uh, there's plenty of space to add new capabilities with profiles and property exchange and the new protocol. And uh, as Adam said earlier, we've just sort of scratched the surface of that, putting into place all the things that we think we need as a foundation right now. Uh, there's a little section about when, because of course these specifications have not all been approved yet by MMA and AME, but we feel confident enough to tell you all about them now because I think we're very close. And if you need to know more now, you can't wait until the specifications have been ratified and published. You can join the MMA now and then you have early access to all the draft specifications. Yeah, Rick, not just not just the specifications, you know, the, the prototype being working group uh, and the protocol working group and the property exchange groups have d done a lot of work. They've developed a lot of code that we're sharing on the MMA GitHub. Um, you know, there's a MIDI 2.0 scope app, app that was developed by Art and Logic, and uh, Brett Porter's doing an amazing job of putting those things together. There's Andrew Mee's workbench, which all of this, all of this is a collaborative effort. Uh, and it is available to uh, anyone who joins the MIDI Manufacturers Association. One of the amazing things about MIDI is that it is all about uh, companies that typically are very competitive in the marketplace getting together and agreeing to work for the betterment of their customers in general. Um, and, that, you know, that is the thing that really does differentiate MIDI from a lot of other international digital standards. It's, it's a, a very much of a collaborative effort. Um, I'm, I'm going to open it up to the rest of the panel if they, if anybody would like to, um, you know, point out some things. I, I thought it might be a good idea. Um, Mike, could you talk a little bit about the way groups and MIDI 1.0 and MIDI 2.0 work together um, 
it, it, I think we need to make it clear that it, the MIDI 1.0 and MIDI 2.0 messages are, are defined by the group. So you can only have each group, there are 16 groups, each group can run either MIDI 1.0 or MIDI 2.0. You can't mix those messages because that would be very uh, complicated to handle from, from a lot of perspective. Sure. Um, so one of one of the fundamental ideas we had in MIDI 2.0 development was we're not replacing MIDI 1.0. And MIDI 1.0 continues very much as part of this new environment. And so the universal MIDI packet um, supports both MIDI 1.0 and MIDI 2.0 messages. And uh, in fact, there's a lot of common messages between them, system exclusive and all the system common and system real time messages are identical in MIDI 1.0 and MIDI 2.0. Uh, the only only difference between MIDI 1.0 messages and MIDI 2.0 messages exists in the what we call a channel voice messages. These are messages that are channelized. So they're notes and controllers, um, pitch bend and those kinds of things. And um, Within one group, uh, Rick talked about these groups, uh, each uh, 16 of them, each having 16 MIDI channels. Within one group, you cannot mix MIDI 1.0 channel voice messages and MIDI 2.0 channel voice messages. Uh, there's complexities if you tried to do that that we, we felt were, were uh, needed to be avoided. And so each group can be a MIDI 1.0 uh, stream. Uh, and that's an expanded MIDI 1.0 stream with some of these new messages like SysX8 and mixed data and jitter reduction timestamps. We're adding those new features to MIDI 1.0. Uh, or it's a MIDI 2.0 stream uh, with all of those new features and the extended resolution in the channel voice messages. So e either one of those can fit inside a group. And it's decided in each group, MIDI CI is how, is how we negotiate whether they're going to use MIDI 1.0 or MIDI 2.0 on each of the groups. What this allows is for a device to be able to send either MIDI 1.0 or MIDI 2.0, depending on what devices it's connected to. So uh, the other, the other uh, key here is that each one of these groups uh, can connect to a MIDI 1.0 device. And so uh, if I'm... Uh, I've got a MIDI 1.0 device and I want to address it, but my data is on, you know, uh, on group four. Um, then on group four, I would uh, set that group to send or receive MIDI 1.0 data. While on group three, I could be sending MIDI 2.0 data to a different device that understands MIDI 2.0 2 uh, data. Um, or I could put a translator, translation between MIDI 1.0 and MIDI 2 is quite simple. So I could put a, a translator on a group. So if I want to transmit um, MIDI 2.0 and it's going to several places, some MIDI 2.0 devices and some MIDI 1.0 devices, I could put a translator also on that group so that uh, the MIDI 1.0 devices that are listening uh, will get uh, data that they understand. So we're protecting backwards compatibility again and making MIDI 1.0 completely uh, completely integrated as a part of MIDI 2.0. I presume that in the CI protocol, we have the ability to decide when we're doing MIDI 1.0 and we're going to send jitter reduction timestamps or SysX8, we need to verify that the uh, device can receive those even though the MIDI 1.0. Right. So, so it would be a new MIDI 1.0 device talking to another new MIDI 1.0 device. And that's right. And this is where MIDI CI again comes comes into play. And the devices don't use those extended features unless the device on either end says, yes, I can use, for example, these jitter reduction timestamps. If the other device doesn't doesn't confirm that it can use the reduction the, the jitter reduction timestamps, then you send MIDI 1.0 data without them. Yeah, and actually, that is that that particular aspect of it is covered uh, in a an update uh, for the BCI specification because jitter timestamps was developed after the adoption of the uh, the initial MIDI CI specification. Uh, thanks, Mike. Um, I think we're.
I think we're going to open it up for questions. I have not seen any questions on uh, on on the chat board, but I'm sure there must be of the um, you know 17, 18 so, listeners. Athen, yes, sir. I have. Um, there have been a couple of questions that have come through. Um, Great. I, the first one is from Dandy Danny. He asks. What will be the minimum hardware requirements microcontroller-wise for MIDI 2.0? Well, that's a, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, you know, one of the things that we tried to do uh, was in all of the aspects of developing property exchange profile and, um, and MIDI 2.0, we tried to take that into account. Um, we, we, I believe that MIDI 2.0, well, uh, let me phrase it like this. Um, we have actually done some experimentation uh, very early on on run, running of the protocol on very small uh, devices like Arduino. So I, I think you will be able, uh, you should be able to run MIDI 2.0 on very, very inexpensive microcontrollers, uh, very expensive devices, including things like our du Arduinos and, 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 and that kind of do-it-yourself do it, do it stuff, which is another part of MIDI, which is very important to everybody. Hope that answers the question. Anybody else have any thoughts? Any, anybody else want to jump in on that? The only other thing that we might want to say right now is that the devices that are only using the five pin din and only have an output for example like if it's a simple controller or only have an input if it's a very simple receiver those ones are not going to be able to negotiate into the higher feature levels um, but any new device that's using something like usb will be able to have um the potential for these sort of capabilities to be added because of the bi-directional communication and they can negotiate which exact features they've enabled that make sense for their products. No, that's a great point, Rick. You know, all of MIDI CI assumes bi-directionality. So the, because of the five pinned in, there was a separate in and out. They were, you didn't have to connect both of them. Um, MIDI was always a monologue and what MIDI CI did was it assumed bi-directionality and said that MIDI can change from a monologue to now being a dialogue and the two devices can communicate with each other to explore what capabilities they have and that's really the fundamental part of MIDI CI that makes it so incredibly powerful. Another thing that might be worth mentioning if, that, if it wasn't highlighted explicitly is that um, you know, even given that CI and the MIDI 2 protocol support this enormous wealth of features, uh, the barrier for entry for someone implementing a MIDI 2 device, you don't have to support this giant feature set. CI allows your device to say, I support this one or these two features that are you know of specific utility to your application, and you know, you only need to implement what you want to use and then your device can negotiate and say hey i support this feature or this feature and uh and so the the burden of implementation is not high even though the total feature set is much is much greater um you know uh, phil phil burke brought up a great point he 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 asked us to talk a little bit about the benefits to mus musicians and composers in their terms so uh, obviously, well, the, if I could add a question from the audience that ties right into that, we can, we right. can, and so, and, and also I'm selfish because this, this is good for me. And um, so this is a question from Cameron Schmitz. Um, I'm going to reword it just slightly because I'm a banjoist. Um, uh, Cameron asks, will MIDI 2.0 be advantageous for um, guitar and banjo and other string synth users, uh, faster, better tracking, etc.? So, so tracking is not something that MIDI does. That's, that's actually a separate technology. However, uh, having said that, one of the major advantages of MIDI 2.0 is the fact that we will have per note controllers. Uh, one of the 
very interesting things about guitars and banjos. Uh, you know, as a keyboard player, the first time that the guitar said to, to me that, yeah, I have six middle C's on my guitar, it just blew my mind. I mean, <laughs> but it is true. Um, the, the way that string instruments are a very different paradigm. And actually, string instruments, um, although you can do it with channels, just like you, you can do MPE and get um, an, a version of per note controllers by by putting each uh, you know string on a separate channel, it will benefit greatly from MIDI 2.0 per note controllers. And the other thing is is that with one of the big new features in MIDI 2.0 is the ability to con directly control pitch. Um, this was something that, that, you know, when the ideas for MIDI, uh, MIDI 2 first started, it was very clear that one of the things that we wanted to do was expand beyond just the keyboard interfaces that exist and to make it much more powerful for non-Western music uh, for, uh, you know, microtonal scales, all of those things, and, and the ability to directly control pitch by using uh, the attribute fields in the per note on, uh, um, tremendous power. In fact, in the article, you can see some demonstrations of that that we did at the Winter NAM show, which is actually, it, it is actually sending MIDI 2.0 messages that have per note pitch control and showing what the possibilities are for that. Yeah, uh, Athan, if I could just uh, jump in for just a, a, a brief uh, additional point uh, to, to what you said about tracking. Uh, yeah, the genesis of pitch tracking is its own technology and, would, and happens outside of MIDI, but these additional um, per note controls and direct pitch control will enable a MIDI 2 device to obtain the benefit of much better tracking algorithms as they're developed. You know, you'll get much better translation from that tracking to the actual sound that you're controlling. Yeah, and that is also true. Sorry, that is also true. Things like, uh, things like um, uh, CV to MIDI, right? So, so con control voltage has no Nyquist limit. Uh, it is not, you know, it 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 has no red. Um, it it is not limited in its resolution because it's actually an analog thing. Uh, and so when you translate from control voltage to 127 steps of MIDI currently, you lose a lot of, uh, of that um, resolution. This new MIDI 2.0 resolution will allow much, much finer control. Uh, another example would be something, uh, you know, using resolution for... Um, properties that actually relate to pitch. For example, FM. FM is based on actual frequencies. You can't control FM directly with 127, uh, 128 steps of MIDI. What you need is you need something that has the kind of 32-bit resolution that we're bringing uh, in MIDI 2.0. Um, yeah. And one more completely different aspect of the banjo controller is that if we have manufacturers that are interested we can create a banjo profile so that receiver devices might know that the controller is a banjo controller and auto configure themselves in such a way that makes it easier more convenient uh, for your controller to to provide a good result when you're when you're playing yeah, um, the, 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 work with in, uh, we're always looking at sort of non-keyboard instruments uh, because the original MIDI was really sort of keyboard focused uh, for key up, key down. Uh, and another area uh, besides string uh, is in the area of sort of multi-touch tablets, which is one reason that Android's interested. And multi-touch tablets are can make very good use of the per note controllers because uh, each finger can generate you know independent stream of events and you know vibrato on one finger and not on another and so it's very good for sort of new kinds of controllers uh, that, that track a lot more gestures and a lot more expression so i think mini 2.0 will allow for some very expressive kind of instruments that um, uh, really are, are sort of more musical in, in a way 
Yeah, Phil, that's a, that's a, that's a really great point. I, I think if you boiled MIDI 2.0 down into two things, which is very difficult to do, I think for the be the benefits for the musician are in in increased uh, expression. So increased expression in terms of the note on will now have attributes that that will give you more information about what is happening. Uh, it, it will have increased resolution, so and and it will have increased abilities to use per note controllers, which we can all see from MPE has really expanded uh, ex expressiveness for musicians. And the second thing is a, a mantra that, that I have always had, um, which is making it easy is really difficult. So when you listen to a lot of the the behind the scenes stuff that we're talking about, it it can appear very complicated. Because what we're trying to do, that's the case with program change, where we've now integrated bank into program change. It's, it's, the, it's the same thing with assignable controllers and registered controllers, where we've taken three messages and made them one message. We're really, um, certainly profile configuration and property exchange, we're trying to make it much easier for the musician to be more expressive. And, and to me, that's yeah. the essence. 2.0. I, I have a, a so we have a bunch of questions from the audience that are queued up. Um, I'm going to try to consolidate a couple of them. Um, one of them is uh, trying to speak to a question that Kinsey has asked, along with Scott Stickland, um, re regarding latency. Um, are we expecting any sort of increase in latency based on increased packet size, um, or in particular, any increase in latency for MIDI 1.0 device note on and sound? Um, so any, any comments on, on expected latency um, based on any of the changes? Well, we have jitter timestamps, so that, that should actually improve the jitter. The, um, uh, the one of the things that we are, are looking at um, is USB actually has plenty of capability to send the, the a MIDI. Uh, and even MIDI 2.0. We're, we're not even pushing the limit of USB as it gets faster and faster. Um, but we are looking at some of the, the issues that have occurred. Um, what's the easiest way to describe this? When you are sending out from a computer, you don't know what is on the other end. So you don't know whether it's a a, you're sending out on a USB port or whether that stream of data is eventually going to end up on a five pin DIN. And so what some applications actually do is some ap applications actually throttle uh, what they're sending out, even if it's over USB, uh, to the, the 31.25 bandwidth of MIDI. So we, we so the the simple answer is we actually expect there to be improvements across the board um, because we'll be able to to include some more messaging about that. And the second thing is, of course, that one of the issues, which is jitter, will should be improved by using jitter timestamps. I shouldn't talk about that because I'm a marketing guy. Does a, does an actual engineer want to speak to it? <laughs> They like your answer, Ethan. <laughs> um, so an additional question that, that I think I actually know the answer to, but I won't take, I won't field the answer. But the question is, will MIDI 2.0 be able to run over IP? Um, and, and so this has been asked by a number of different um, audience members. So if anyone could speak to the transport side of this, that would be great. I think I can jump in here. Um, MIDI 2.0 is designed to be transport agnostic. In other words, we, we don't have a specific transport that um, is the MIDI 2.0 transport. Um, I was actually just typing an answer about this uh, into the comments as well. Um, and so I just hit send on that. Um, uh, MIDI already has an RTP MIDI specification, for example. And we could update that to support the universal MIDI packet so that MIDI 1.0 and MIDI 2.0 data can go over there, um, uh, over that existing uh, RTP MIDI spec. Um, personally, I have um, interest in AVB or time-sensitive networking, and uh, and I might I might lead the work on writing a specification for that. 
Um, basically, any transport that that uses packets and has has the characteristics we need for um, timely delivery of messages could be a, a, a target transport for MIDI 2.0. Uh, at this point in the MIDI industry, I'm guessing 80% of the MIDI messages that are sent today uh, between any, any MIDI uh, uh, devices, 80% is probably over USB. So we certainly have thought about USB as, as a first target transport that's, that's terribly important because we're already using it in such a, an important way. So uh, we'll have, uh, I think there'll be a, a, a transport spec for how this goes over USB, and we'll probably come up with some for how, how our MIDI 2 goes over some kind of network connection as well. And there'll probably be more than one. Uh, so there were a couple, of, I'm looking at a couple of questions and I'm just gonna jump in. Uh, it, there's one question from Travis W. Will it be possible for developers, researchers, users, hackers, as et cetera, to define custom profiles and or attributes, or will these be defined exclusively by the MMA and AME? Uh, that's a, a great question. Uh, one of the things that we have done uh, is uh, in almost all cases, certainly with profiles and property exchange, we have allowed the ability for manufacturers to develop their own profiles and their own property exchange messages. And the reason for that is it allows for experimentation. Um, there is actually a, um, there is actually a, a SysX ID, uh, which is uh, controlled by the MMA and AME, and it is for non-commercial uses. Uh, so it, it, it is possible to do that, but you, you can't, you can't use that and then create a, a product and sell it because that involves, uh, you know, some other things. So th I think the answer is a little bit of both to that. Um, and the other thing is, is that in, in terms of custom profiles, you can develop those things, but they will only work within the context of for example, if it's manufacturer specific, it will only work with y your company's products that um, you know uh, implement that profile. We are hoping that profiles and property exchange will um, increase interoperability. So people will experiment with a profile, then they'll get together with a, a bunch of like-minded companies and say, "We developed this guitar pro guitar synth profile." We think this is the right way to do it. We'll share it, and eventually it will get adopted as an MMA specification. So, Ethan, on that line, I have a question from Guido, um, who's joined us on a bunch of these webinars. We're appreciative of that, Guido. Um, Guido asks, is it possible to send MIDI 2.0 messages between two hardware devices, two synthesizers, for example? Uh, it depends on the transport. So the answer is yes, but there is no transport specification for that yet. Um, personally, I think a network is the way to do this, and, and a network allows peer-to-peer -peer or um, you know more than two peers to to talk over a network. And so that's that's personally my my answer, uh, or I think where we should be going. And and I would like to see our industry also um, get on my soapbox a little bit here. Our our industry should also be adopting an audio specification. And if we can come up with an audio specification where all MIDI instruments are transferring audio to each other, it seems to me that a network is the right way to do that, and MIDI can ride along on the same network. Um, but that's some, somewhat out of the purview of the MIDI Manufacturers Association, um, uh, talking about how audio connections should be made. Um, but uh, I'd love to see an audio spec for between devices. In, our industry centers around one of those, then we're going to put MIDI on that for sure. But um, it's going to take some years for all of these specs to to come along, and uh, that might be one that that we don't see for several years. Just voicing my agreement with Mike on that. I've also been typing some of the same things into the chat. No, this is Rick. 
Yeah, and and actually, you know, all of all of those people who are, are commenting on that, if you have a relationship with AES or you work for a company that that is involved with uh, AES uh, six seven, you know, um, MIDI it, it takes a village with MIDI. Uh, so we we absolutely encourage everybody who has ideas about MIDI to join the MIDI Manufacturers Association. It is. It is a tremendous value. Um, it is not particularly expensive. Um, membership is is done based on revenue. So if you're a small company, uh, it, it is currently um, an annual fee of five hundred dollars, which also includes a SysX ID, which is two hundred and fifty dollars annually. So, you know, for two hundred and fifty dollars, you you have the ability an extra two hundred and fifty dollars because you need a SysX ID to do MIDI two point. Um, and, and MIDI CI for, for that $250, you get access to all of, all, all of the, the work that's been done. You get access to all of the specifications that are under development. You get a voice in the new specifications, uh, and you get to, you know, contribute to moving MIDI into the future. So we, we encourage everybody to join the MMA. We think it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's valuable. And, and we have recently, I will say, uh, you know, Fran Franz uh, from Native Instruments is on, is on the phone. Uh, he has been a, a great contributor. We have a lot of new members. Ableton is a fairly recent member. Native Instruments is a fairly recent member. Uh, Mind Music Labs. Uh, we've had a lot of people join the MMA in, in the last year and a half because they have taken a look at what is happening with MIDI 2.0, and they've gotten very excited about it. And they have made great contributions, uh, and we still have all of the people, uh, you know, Phil Burke, Rick Cohen, uh, Mike Kent, Florian, uh, all of the people who have been working for many, many years on uh, developing MIDI 2.0. So we're just getting more powerful as an organization, and I want to thank everybody for, um, for all of the work that they've done on this. The best way to make sure that MIDI uh, supports exactly the applications that you have in mind is to join the MMA and become a part of the conversation and share your requirements. And we all work together to, to make it happen. Yeah, just, uh, you know, Tom, Tom posted something and it, it is important to note that the, the MIDI Manufacturers Association is, is for corporations that develop um, uh, and companies that develop MIDI products. Now that doesn't mean that it can't be a, a company of, of one person where we have a lot of those companies and, and we're very happy and they make great contributions. The MIDI association is targeted more towards end users. Uh, and we, ha so the MIDI manufacturers association has about 65 or so, um, members, companies. Again, it includes Apple, Google, Microsoft, Yamaha, uh, Roland, uh, Native Instruments, Ableton, uh, every, uh, you know, all, a lot of different companies. We have now 20,000 members in the MIDI Association. The MIDI Association is free to join, and it is really the way that the companies that are involved in the MIDI Manufacturer Association, it's a vehicle for them to communicate directly with their end users who are the people who buy MIDI products. And a great example of that is May is MIDI month. Uh, we, we, you know, the, the, these webinars are brought to you by, by uh, the MIDI Association because we're reaching out to end users. And this month we were able to meet our goal of raising $2,000 in individual do donations. Those donations were matched by MIDI Manufacturers Association companies. And we've raised $22,000 uh, this, in this past month. Now, what we will use that money for is developing materials partly for developers, uh, smaller independent developers, but mostly for educational materials to explain MIDI 2.0 to end users and explain the benefits to them. Because when MIDI 1.0 first came out, all of the large manufacturers spent millions of dollars putting brochures into every MIDI product that explained what MIDI was and explained channels and it's like a TV set. You've got different channels. You've got 16 channels you can dial up. Um, over the years, 
MIDI has become such an integral part of the way that music is produced that we kind of take it for granted. We have a saying in the MIDI Association that MIDI is like air. It's all around you. Most of the time, you don't have to pay any attention to it, but try to live without it. Uh, and what we need to do now is we actually need to bring that awareness of MIDI back up to the front of the people who are producing music and make them aware of what the capabilities of MIDI 2.0 are. And that's what the MIDI Association is about. So we've run a little bit over. Does anybody have a question that they really need to be answered? Because we're, we're happy to we're happy to stay a little bit longer. Lawrence, are there so more I, in I the queue? There, there's a few, and one in particular that I wanted to put forward that I think is a really good question and topical. Uh, it's not technical, so but but I'll put it forward anyway. This is from Dandy Danny. Another question from Dan from Dandy Danny. What can the MIDI Manufacturers Association and partners do to support widespread consumer adoption regarding MIDI 2.0? Um, and so I, I think that speaks to some of the stuff that the MIDI Association is doing. Um, but I'd be curious to know the thoughts from the rest of the panel. Could, could you repeat the question? Sorry. Sure. What can the MMA, the MIDI Manufacturers Association, and partners do to support widespread consumer adoption regarding MIDI 2.0? Well, um, uh, well, we oh, go on, Evan. Go ahead. No, go ahead, Rick. I was going to say, I think that the additional capabilities of the MIDI CI stuff and the uh, MIDI 2 protocol will help drive some new innovative products. And those products will help bring people, uh, people being other manufacturers, you know, into the, into the uh, MIDI 2 ecosystem you know that's exactly what i was going to say is, is um you know and yamaha has you know um i can't tell you specifically what they are but we plan on making some killer midi 2.0 products um you have to remember that back uh in the day when uh in 1983 when when midi was introduced um there were there were some very fortuitous product launches. One was the DX7, which was a very successful product for Yamaha, and it had MIDI on it. Um, there was also uh, the Atari computer, um, which that was another um, product that had MIDI on it that really drove the adoption of MIDI, especially in the computer industry. And those were pretty lucky times because that was when the world was transitioning from the world of electronics to the world of digital. Um, we believe that MIDI 2.0 has all of the things necessary to make some very, very expressive and very, very easy to use products. And that's what's going to drive adoption, nothing else. Um, I think you will see software manufacturers adopting MIDI 2.0 fairly quickly because software can tend uh, to move a little bit faster than hardware development. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I think I think you will see in the next couple of years, let's say, uh, you will start to see MIDI 2.0 products that will gain attention in the marketplace. And that's what's going to attract people to it. So I'm going to get, give one more question out here, which which will be I'll be curious to see how you dance on this one, Athen. Um, but but it's Travis has asked, when can we hope for the release of the 2.0 spec to the public? Oh, yeah, I was just going to type and answer that. But since you brought it up, then we can just discuss it here and I don't have to keep typing. Thank you. Yeah, no, I mean, I think we can say uh, the, the MIDI specification um, has been completed. It is It has gone through uh, MMA membership review. Um, and so we are very far down the process, but the processes take time and there's, and there's some administrative things that do take time. For example, uh, we adopted the common rules for, for profiles at the Winter NAM show, and that's not up on the MIDI, uh, it's not on, on MIDI.org yet. 
Um, things just, you know, do take time. And part of the reason that they do take time is because we have two organizations. Um, we have, we have the, there was a Japanese MIDI organization and there is the MMA. The good news is, uh, the good news is, is that, that AME and the MMA have been working very closely in the last several years. Um, the AME actually, you know, a lot of the work that was done for MIDI 2.0, uh, um, uh, Mizumoto san from Roland is the chairman of the FME CI working group. Uh, Sugashima san from Yamaha is the head of the AME Technical Standards Board. And they have been very cooperative uh, and we have been working very closely together. And there is no disagreement between AME and the MMA in terms of how we want to move forward. So it's really just a matter of time. Um, we all have complete confidence that, that the work will get done and that eventually everything will be made available to the public. I, I wanted to take a moment. This is the fourth of these uh, four webinars we are doing, and I wanted to thank Athen for tirelessly coordinating all of these things. It's been remarkable watching it from the inside, and Athen, thank you so much for everything that you do for, for MIDI in, in both the TMA and the MMA. Oh, thanks. Well, it, like I said, it, it takes the village and everybody who's on the call, all of the panelists, and I want to thank the panelists uh, for their contributions. Franz, I feel bad you didn't didn't get to, and Florian, you you guys did not get to speak, but can you, can you just chime in a little bit at the end and and, uh, and just talk a little bit about your feeling, Florian, your feelings about MIDI 2.0? Uh, well, yes, um, I've also been involved with it for probably more than 10 years. And um, my main focus has always been on translation and we just didn't, talk much about translation today, so that's okay. The main thing is that it'll work and that there'll be products for translation software and hardware products, so that MIDI 1 and MIDI 2 products are interoperable. Great. Franz, can you jump in and speak a little bit about native instruments? I, mean, I don't know what you can talk about, but we, <laughs> but we did see some interesting uh, prototypes from, from native instruments already. Yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. We, we at Native Instruments are, are really excited on, on all this uh, MIDI 2.0 stuff and uh, discussing possibilities uh, for the users for more expressive use of uh, music creations and how we really can uh, uh, make features of uh, our products uh, more accessible using this MIDI 2.0. But yeah, it's, it's all in discussion and uh, uh, we are quite excited about this. So I think, yeah, at some pass uh, down the road, uh, you will see probably lots of great products not only for native instruments, but also for a lot of other companies, which which really give a great, great, great uh, uh, plus on usability for the users. So uh, I'm I'm really excited to be here, and uh, yeah, okay, that's from my side. Thank you. Well, I would like to thank all of the of the participants in the panel and all of our audience members. We had a lot of great questions, and we will be. Um, this has been recorded. Uh, I'd like to finally thank Lawrence Levine. Uh, Lawrence uh, is the person who provides this platform uh, to the MIDI, the MIDI Association. Um, we don't actually pay money for this service. Uh, this is a, a platform that Lawrence has developed, and he's been doing a lot of uh, using us. Uh, to push the platform, and there's some exciting things that uh, we will be talking about uh, in terms of MIDI Live coming up. We're going to be changing the user interface and adding some new functionality that will be very exciting for everybody. So I want to thank Lawrence. Uh, and Lawrence is saying it shouldn't take very long because we don't have video. By the way, we already have the Controllerism uh, webinar videos are up. Um, we already have uh, the Guthman uh, musical instrument, all, all three of the winners of the Guthman musical instrument uh, contest, contest this year were MIDI controllers, and that, that's some really interesting stuff. That was a great webinar. And we are working on right now editing the early MIDI webinar that we had last week. 
uh, and we have more webinars planned in the future. Uh, one of the ones that we've been talking about is doing a, a specific webinar on Arduinos uh, and DIY uh, uh, boards because we, we think there's a lot of interest in that. So if you have interest in that particular area, you can always contact us at info at uh, midi.org. And we want to thank you for joining us. And we're going to sign off now and uh, go back to the green room and chat. The panelists will chat privately for a little bit. But we want to thank you for joining us on the final May is Midi Month webinar 2019. Thanks. <laughs>